Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, fellow young leaders, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be able to begin uh, the day here at ICD uh, by introducing a very special uh, keynote speaker, uh, Ms. Christina Ujuland. Ms. Ujuland has uh, such an extensive resume, I still don't think I'll do justice to it, uh, but I do want to make it a point to, to inform you of really some of the tremendous experience that she's bringing, uh, not only to Estonia, but also to Europe. Ms. Ojulan was born in uh, Kota Jerve, Estonia, in 1966, a graduate of law uh, from the University of Tartu in 1990, then the Estonian School of Diplomacy, uh, where she graduated in 1992 as a diplomat. She then did her MA at the University of Tartu in political science, uh, followed by advanced training in graduate at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Switzerland in 1992, then the University of Birmingham, Birmingham as well, and the Vienna Diplomatic Academy in 1993. So truly a European education in that sense. Uh, she then began her career at the Ministry of Justice, uh, where she served as specialist in the draft legislation department uh, until 1992. She was then first secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs from 92 to 94. Estonian Permanent Representative to the Council of Europe from 1993 until 1994. Managing Director of the Estonian Broadcasting Union from 94 <laughs> until 96, where you got your experience uh, more in the field of media. Uh, then Director of the Institute for European Integration at Concordia International University from 97 until 2001. She then uh, also had an extensive experience in the Estonian Reform Party. Uh, she was the Secretary for External Relations from 95 until 2002 member of the executive from 96 to 2009, vice chair from 2003 until 2007, vice president then of the European Liberal Democratic uh, Ref uh, Democrat and Reform Party uh, from roughly 1998 until 2009 uh, in different episodes. In terms of the Estonian parliament, she also has an extensive experience. She was member of the Estonian parliament from 94 until 2009, Chair of their European Union Affairs Committee from 2005 until 2007, and first Deputy Speaker of the Estonian Parliament from 2007 until 2009. Her career didn't end there. Uh, she then continued to be leader of the LDR Group, uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, PACE, in 1999 until 2002. Vice President of PACE from 96 until 2002, Head of the Estonian Delegation to PACE from 96 to 2002, and Member of the Tallinn City Council from 96 until 2002. I think one of the high points of her career, and there were many high points, was in the period from 2002 until 2005, where she served as the Foreign Minister of Estonia. She's currently a member of the European Parliament since 2009. Uh, she's on the Committee for Foreign Affairs, and delegation to the EU-Russia Parliamentary Cooperation Committee, so very relevant for this conference, uh, sub-institute member of the Subcommittee on Human Rights, and delegation to the EU-Armenia, EU-Azerbaijan, EU-Georgia Parliamentary Cooperation Committees, as well as the ALDE Group spokesperson on Russia. She's a member of the advisory board of the broader European Leadership Agenda the Foundation, member of the advisory board of the Center for European Perspective, member of the board of the Lean Viru Institute of Applied Higher Education. Uh, those are the main highlights of her career, but actually, as you can see, uh, she's been very busy, uh, and there's even more that I could say, but I'll, I'll stop there with her career. I would like to indicate, however, she's received many awards. Uh, some of the most important uh, are Commander of the French Legion of Honor, uh, Fifth Class of the Order of the National Coat of Arms of Estonia, World Economic Forum Global Leader for Tomorrow, Grand Cross of Order of Prince Henry the Navigator, Grand Officer of the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic, Commander's Cross of the Order of the Lithuanian Grand Duke Gedimas, and Grand Decoration of Honor in Gold with Star for Services to the Republic of Austria. So really a woman of tremendous experience, both within Estonia and also within the European sphere, has been dedicating a lot of her energy and efforts in particular to the European-Russian relationship. So for all of the reasons that you can imagine from hearing her CV, uh, as well as everything else you know about her, I think really you know, a perfect speaker for this conference. We really look forward to engaging with you uh, with the lecture, uh, as well as also a panel discussion uh, that will be uh, thereafter uh, with another special guest, well, soon. Uh, but first of all, I would like to really give a very, very warm welcome for Ms. <laughs> Ujuland. Her lecture topic is Growing Challenges to the EU-Russia Cooperation. So if you could please join me in a very, very warm and heartfelt uh, welcome uh, to Ms. Christina Ujuland. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Good morning, everybody, <laughs> and uh, thank you, Mark, uh, very much for this um, very warm uh, introduction, uh, even if it sounded like a <laughs> little bit like a necrologue, <laughs> what I have been doing <laughs> in my life, <laughs> but I, I hope not to die soon <laughs> yet. <laughs> 
Well, uh, it's not the first time when I'm here and, um, and I'm, I'm really honored and, and pleased to be with you here in this morning and, um, and especially pleased uh, to speak um, about uh, EU-Russia relations. About Russia, which is, um, of course, the neighbor of the European Union and not only a neighbor, a very big, a very important and uh, in many ways a strategic neighbor. I didn't say strategic partner in the moment, but strategic neighbor. <laughs> and I, uh, uh, as I know that uh, many of you are also coming from Russia. How many actually can you show? Dobre utro i show vam na ruskom toże, tak što oče prijatno srećat sa s vami stjesno. No, I will, uh, I have to speak in English <laughs> in this uh, conference this morning. Um, well, uh, the size of Russia, of course, uh, is something uh, what uh, people uh, in everyday activities uh, in Europe, in European institutions, also the politicians sometimes don't realize. If we think about Russia, sometimes we simply th thinking about Moscow, St. Petersburg region. But if you uh, compare uh, the size of Russia uh, with uh, Europe, for example, then uh, just I took out uh, one of the regions um, uh, in Russia, Yakutia. Uh, and if you compare it with the whole European Union, then uh, you can have uh, really the imagination of the size. And Yakutia, as you see, as, as uh, Russians, they, you know, of course, <laughs> well, where it is in the, in the so I don't have this uh, stick to show, uh, oh, but uh, this uh, dark green um, at the end of this map, the bigger size is, is Yakutia. So the size is big, and, and Russia is a challenging uh, country, always has been, uh, even... Uh, even during the time uh, with a short uh, period of, uh, of um, more uh, liberalization, and I mean the times uh, of 90s, uh, the times of, of Yeltsin time in, in office. Uh, but uh, Russia has been always a challenge, and, and not only for uh, the current, not only for uh, nowadays uh, policy makers, um, uh, not only for a nowadays world, but uh, I think it has been uh, throughout the se uh, centuries, the history, a challenge uh, for cooperation uh, with the rest of, of the world. And as Winston Churchill uh, used to say that uh, Russia is a mysterious country. And I think this is really the best definition on, on Russia in many ways, including the cultural meaning, because uh, mysterious uh, 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 it is not only by its um, uh, politics, by its uh, uh, attitudes um, towards fest for West, for example, but um, of course Russia is mysterious by its history, by its culture, by its nature, uh, by its natural resources, as you know that all the Mendeleev stable is, is uh, presented in, in, in this huge territory. It is a mysterious country with um, such uh, uh, a high uh, um, challenges uh, and opportunities, in my view, what are unfortunately not implemented, at least by the current uh, political leadership. And, and uh, as you may uh, expect, uh, I, I, I may sound quite critical today in my presentation. Well, uh, where we are now, nowadays with Russia, where we stand, um, uh, just before we go into the details, um, uh, still I would put back this map, but just let me say some introductory remarks uh, about uh, the, the, uh, the, the current situation and the current uh, understanding. And I'm not speaking only on behalf of the European Union, but uh, also the um, understanding um, uh, in the United States of America about Russia is uh, is is also uh, the same that Russia uh, is not a democracy. Uh, in the moment, in this uh, Putin's um, time in office uh, as a president, as a prime minister, and now again come becoming a president again, uh, Russia has uh, lost its uh, democratic uh, institutions, its democratic uh, ground, and uh, nowadays Russia is uh, taken and, and called as an autocratic regime. And this is open and public uh, definition on, on Russia in the European Union institutions, but also in the United States of America. 
And uh, um, the last uh, the report on, uh, uh, of the Freedom House, which is one of the oldest uh, human rights uh, NGOs uh, in the United States and, and uh, has a very broad uh, international um, appreciation. Uh, the Freedom House report, uh, uh, which was actually yesterday just presented in Brussels in the European Parliament too, they um, declare Russia a country which is not free. And uh, that means that, uh, what it means if, if the country is not free? It means that uh, the human rights are not respected. Uh, it means uh, that uh, there are no free and fair elections, and we come back to the elections issue, of course. Um, last elections in December and in March uh, have been um, uh, declared not free and fair, not only by Freedom House, but of course by the OSC, by the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, and, and also by the European institutions, including European Parliament. Uh, not free means also that in the country uh, does not uh, exist a fair judiciary and uh, the country is not uh, the, the state of rule of law. And uh, in this respect, um, uh, we don't need uh, to find uh, uh, examples, um, uh, not, uh, not, not less than the uh, Hodorkovsky case, uh, like uh, Mikhail Hodorkovsky is, um, is um, uh, uh, in international um, uh, terms, uh, he he's, uh, is called uh, as a political prisoner, uh, and and of course the cases like Magnitsky, what we are also took, uh, going to look into this case um, uh, later on in in this uh, uh, in my speech. Uh, all, also, the uh, uh, journalist and, and uh, human rights activists like uh, the death of uh, Estemirova, Politkovskaya, the, the beating up uh, Mr. Kashin, the journalist, and, and others, all those show that um, uh, in, the, in the country uh, there, is, uh, there is no existing the rule of law. And uh, by the way, yesterday, uh, the uh, director of the Freedom House, Mr. David Kramer, just uh, told to the European Parliament that, uh, that their colleague uh, uh, from Freedom House was just beaten up in, in Moscow streets. And, and that's, of course, uh, um, well, it's very difficult to uh, prove who did it, but uh, they have some, uh, some, some doubts. And of course, uh, not free means that uh, in the country there is no free media, which, is, which means that the media is under the control of the existing uh, political regime. And, and as, as you all know well, that, uh, that uh, Mr. Putin is, is controlling uh, 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 and his team is controlling uh, clearly the major two uh, TV channels. And I'm not speaking about uh, the less um, smaller media, media uh, uh, institutions. And, uh, and also, not free means that uh, you don't have the right uh, for association, or the right is limited. And, and uh, later on, I hope uh, that the Russian um, uh, representatives will uh, come this afternoon or tomorrow morning. You will, uh, you will hear the representatives uh, of uh, Russian political opposition here. Uh, and I'm speaking about Parnas, uh, which uh, was not registered, hasn't been registered for, for years. The case is uh, um, in, in, the, in Strasbourg uh, Human Rights Court. Uh, and then despite of, uh, of any uh, also international pressure, uh, Parnas uh, is not registered. And, and I can understand that uh, Mr. Putin's uh, uh, regime uh, is very much afraid uh, to allowing uh, those people uh, to run the elections in, in free and unfair competition because uh, if you look the last um, outcome uh, of the parliamentary elections then the United Russia even with this uh, um, uh, big falsifications did not gain 50% uh, of the seats in, in the state Duma. So, um, uh, when uh, we say that uh, Russia is, uh, is not democracy, then what it is? What it is? What, uh, what, how it, what can it be called? And, and, uh, and again, if you, if you read uh, the uh, Indem uh, think tank in, in uh, Russia, then uh, they estimate that uh, the corruption costs uh, in the country are some uh, 300 to 500 billion US dollars out of the GDP of uh, roughly, which is altogether 1.5 uh, um, trillion US dollars. 
that means that uh, about uh, one third or one fourth in between uh, the uh, the uh, the economy of, of the country is is fallen into into the corruption. And uh, and according to Stanislav uh, Bukowski, who is uh, the political analyst, he estimated already in 2005 that uh, out of this corruption money, Mr. Putin uh, owns himself about uh, 25 to 40 billion US dollars, but it was in 2005. Today, we are in 2012, and uh, in many political analyses, uh, uh, Mr. Putin is, is uh, estimated as uh, one of the world's most richest men. So, uh, uh, and uh, what it means then uh, to see that uh, these uh, corruption figures are so serious in, in Russia that, um, that how to, uh, how to um, receive Russia as, as, as a partner and, and even more as, as a strategic partner. Uh, we, uh, we should understand, uh, at least in Europe, that uh, this regime is, um, it, it is corrupt, it's, it's very much interlinked, it's corrupt on the highest level of, of officials, and what they do is, of course, they, they keep their power as, as long and as, as much they can. They are so interlinked and they cannot uh, deliver any more freedoms to their own citizens. And at the same time, of course, they, uh, they probably, uh, this, uh, this regime uh, becomes uh, more and more, um, uh, uh, well, uh, not so friendly, to put it <laughs> politely, not so friendly uh, to its partners um, in the European Union and, and US, while they face more and more criticism from, uh, from, from both sides, from, uh, from the EU and, and from, uh, from the United States of America. Um. Yes, and I think that uh, this is uh, pretty enough uh, for introduction and, and uh, let's see now the reality where it is stands actually. If we speak about uh, uh, the uh, economic relations, of course we come back to the political relations, but um, uh, economic uh, relations are something which, uh, which are real and uh, they exist and we cannot deny them. And, uh, and uh, this is, uh, these are the figures uh, about uh, the, uh, uh, from the last year, uh, quite the fresh figures. Then you can see uh, the, the, um, uh, the numbers here and, and, um, and uh, the, the third point, of course, uh, is, is, is not a secret. Everybody knows that mostly the EU imports from Russia are mainly energy and mineral fuels. Uh, and, uh, and at the same time, of course, it means a lot uh, for uh, Russia um, if we are looking into their incomes, the state budget incomes. So because it's a mutual. On the one hand, one can say that Europe is so dependent on the energy uh, sources from Russia, but at the same time, uh, if Europe would, wouldn't buy this, who buys them? And, 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 and uh, possibly there is, of course, the market in China and then Japan, but for that you need also the infrastructure uh, for delivery. And I, I don't know if you can see these uh, smaller figures also here, but it shows that um, uh, the EU main trade partners, uh, you see uh, where Russia is, it's also very high in EU uh, trade uh, partnership. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's anyway, it's among uh, the uh, first, first trade partners and, and, and probably will remain uh, as, as it stands. And speaking about yes, this uh, delivery uh, of the natural resources, uh, uh, the gas uh, pipelines, uh, you see that they are also here and, and, uh, and uh, this is also the existing reality. It's existing uh, economic reality between EU and, and Russia. Uh, of course, as you know, EU is, uh, is preparing uh, already for um, over many years uh, to find the alternative uh, suppliers uh, and also we are implementing in EU ourselves uh, uh, different um, uh, policies, energy policies, more efficient energy policies um, uh, and, and uh, looking for alternative energy resources uh, 
all the time, this is a part of the policy, in order to reduce the dependence of the, of the Russian energy sources. And, and about Nabucco also, this, uh, there are big fights um, uh, about between Nabucco and, and Southern Stream, but I think this is another topic a little bit and we don't have time enough to, to, to go into the details today with this. And, uh, and this, uh, these are the figures from 2010 about the imports and exports together, so it's uh, in, in, in percentages and, and in, in numbers. And, uh, and yes, once again, Russia's uh, trade uh, with main partners, then you see, um, without any competition, EU is for Russia the main uh, trade partner. Uh, yes, before China and, and, and other countries. So, it means that um, at, and economically we are uh, quite uh, strongly interlinked and um, this economic uh, cooperation uh, uh, definitely mm, uh, will uh, go on, uh, especially what comes to this energy resources, uh, speaking on behalf of the European Union. Uh, speaking uh, about uh, the um, uh, possible uh, investments uh, from the EU to Russia, then uh, I think uh, this is also a very interesting topic because exactly because of the lack of the rule of law uh, in Russia. Uh, creating a great, to, to create a company and uh, to, to try to work in this environment uh, becomes more and more difficult uh, for uh, European investors and the uh, risks are getting higher and higher. And therefore I think again that this uh, is uh, about, uh, uh, about for, for Russian political leadership uh, to uh, think about it, uh, what kind of consequences uh, this uh, may uh, play in their economy if they, if they, if they are not securing um, uh, the companies with the uh, clear and, and, uh, and, um, and the good uh, laws which are implemented. And the WTO, uh, just very shortly speaking, uh, you know that uh, Russia's uh, process to WTO has been a long one and also very political one. <laughs> and uh, and uh, here is the quotation, what I, I like to use is uh, uh, what Mr. Putin has said, uh, finally, um, to excuse uh, domestically the, the uh, accession to the WTO, because over many years in domestic politics, uh, we have heard from, uh, from him always saying, oh, we don't need this WTO, this is just a sort of uh, measures to pressure Russia and put Russia's interests down. But now, uh, since uh, the negotiations are uh, completed and, and Russia is now acceding to the WTO, so now they, they found a, a, a way to explain uh, why the membership uh, in WTO is uh, good for Russia. And the process uh, is, uh, is also here, uh, so it, uh, the ratification comes to the effect in January uh, next year and, and hopefully then also the trade um, between the EU and Russia becomes uh, on much more uh, stronger uh, legs and, and uh, I hope that there will be no uh, in the future such uh, cases like we have faced from time to time that Russia exposes some extra tolls or, or some extra customs or some extra restrictions on, on, on European uh, goods. So, uh, but now coming back uh, to the um, uh, uh, further developments and especially to the political uh, questions, so, uh, what is, uh, and, and, and now I will speak a little bit about the activities, what uh, the European Parliament has been doing over this uh, last uh, two, three years. Then uh, uh, one, uh, the first uh, uh, mm, statement is, is quite clear that, uh, at, that in the discussions, in the debates and also in the resolutions what uh, European Parliament has been adopted on Russia, over the last two years, there is a clear uh, political uh, mm, understanding that we cannot uh, continue with the business as usual with Russia. Uh, and uh, and uh, we, in always in our statements, uh, we, uh, we um, stated that we need to support uh, more civil society uh, and, and opposition forces. And Helsinki 2 uh, uh, Zero conference 
is an interesting uh, initiative. Uh, what uh, my group, uh, the European uh, Liberal and Democrat group, uh, initiated last year in November, we had the first meeting. Uh, you know this Helsinki process uh, from 1975 uh, when uh, still there was a Soviet Union and uh, uh, then the West and, and the Soviet Union agreed on, on certain uh, uh, um, uh, international um, uh, rules, uh, which is nowadays that the OSCE is, is coming, of course, from, from, uh, from that initiative from uh, 75. And But there was one, uh, one uh, point um, which did not concern. In that time, of course, it was, it was very much about the security treaty between the uh, Soviet Union and, and the West. But also there was uh, the package of uh, the protection of human rights and respecting human rights in the Soviet Union. And we initiated uh, this uh, conference. Uh, it's, a, it's a political conference again, because uh, in many ways you can compare uh, the um, uh, threat against the human rights again raising in, inside Russia and that it's of course not the same like in 75 but um, I think exactly the civil society in Russia, the human rights organizations in Russia, the opposition forces in Russia who are under the permanent threat, they need uh, protection and help and, and aid from uh, the EU countries from the West in the moment. And I think that this process uh, in, the, in the 70s, when it was opened, it was very much also um, uh, develop, developed uh, in, uh, in European countries, in, also in European countries, uh, through the NGOs. It wa it, these were not uh, the governments uh, necessarily who helped uh, uh, the, the Soviet uh, human rights organizations in that time, but these Helsinki committees this movement was very broad in 70s and, and 80s and helped and assisted very much uh, the Russian human rights uh, uh, activists and, 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 uh, and, and I think that this is also now uh, again in question uh, that we should do something similar and uh, what we did as I said last year in November we had the first meeting and now we are preparing uh, this year the meeting in Washington in the US uh, the similar type, and, and we do it together in the moment with the Russian um, liberal opposition uh, and, and, and with the human rights organizations. And, and also, it's not mentioned here, but I, I should also mention it uh, here. This is, um, this is uh, uh, all the activities that are taking place uh, now around the Magnitsky case. As you know, uh, in the United States, uh, they have already reached uh, um, uh, so far that uh, in both ho in the both uh, houses uh, they have the so-called Magnitsky Bill, um, uh, which is uh, called um, um, uh, Justice for Magnitsky, and uh, that means uh, that um, the proposal, the legislative proposal, is that uh, the U.S. Uh, should um, uh, pose uh, the visa sanctions uh, and the sanctions against assets uh, f against those uh, Russian high officials who, who were guilty uh, in his death, but not only his death, but in, uh, in all similar cases that uh, are taking or has taken place in, in Russia, that all those um, high officials uh, should not get any visas to US and their uh, assets uh, should be frozen. And, uh, and uh, they, they, uh, they are expecting uh, in the U.S. Uh, probably to adopt this, uh, this bill um, uh, already by, by the uh, end of the spring of this year. Uh, the similar discussions have been taking place in the European Parliament already in 2010, first time the European Parliament adopted uh, the report where um, uh, we um, um, suggested to the member states' governments uh, to um, also to, uh, to, to come up with the visa sanctions. The, 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 minister, the, uh, the governments of EU in, in 2011 did not um, uh, pick up this issue on, on their agenda and now we are coming back with the same proposal. Now, uh, it, uh, the mm, uh, draft recommendation is already initiated in the European Parliament. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's in, in the work and in the working um, uh, in, the, in the committees and, and uh, we, we hope to come back uh, with a full uh, uh, report and vote uh, later this year. 
And in parallel, as you know, that, that the discussions have been taking place in, in several member states, parliaments in the Netherlands, uh, in the UK, and uh, probably the UK is already uh, implementing uh, the visa sanctions uh, which were not published. Uh, the list to say is not published, but uh, we know that uh, visa sanctions are um, uh, implemented in reality in a certain against certain uh, high officials uh, who are in the list of, of Magnitsky and then there are about 60 people. And also yesterday there was a news from uh, Strasbourg from uh, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe where uh, 70 members uh, of uh, that um, assembly also initiated uh, the motion uh, in the same direction. Uh, and that means that also the Council of Europe uh, will probably uh, make a report on the issue and also proposal to their governments, member states' governments, uh, uh, EU governments to, uh, to take the uh, measures against um, those people who are guilty. So you see what, what, what is going on between EU and Russia and then the US and Russia. On the one hand, we keep uh, the economic um, uh, ties, economic relations, the trade, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, the reality. But that, uh, on the other hand, there has been a big change. And, and why I said business, uh, we don't continue as a business as usual, because now the human rights agenda, the democracy agenda, is very much back on the tables again. Because like, um, and then the, the demands that uh, Russia should uh, uh, respect uh, the international law, like they are members of the OSCE, that Russia should respect the uh, Human Rights Convention of the Council of Europe and other conventions where, uh, where it is member, or otherwise they can leave. And then this is, uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is um, uh, very much in political reality that these this, uh, this, uh, things are uh, uh, discussed um, uh, also not only in the European Parliament but also when there are summits between EU and Russia now. Uh, the summits um, between uh, the um, President of Russia and, and, and the leadership of EU, always the human rights agenda, the democracy agenda is, is uh, in the priority place uh, in the negotiations. So, and uh, uh, what the European Parliament has done is that uh, last year we adopted four resolutions on Russia uh, about the human rights violations, about the lack of rule of law, and, and, um, and also uh, about the elections. This has uh, been unique in the history of the European Union uh, Parliament, because never ever they haven't adopted four resolutions on Russia in one year and uh, even this year already two. So it's, uh, it's, it means that, uh, that really, on the one hand, Russia is a very important uh, partner for us, but we, 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 we cannot be silent, we, we cannot just be, um, uh, in the, well, um, uh, just not paying attention on that, on that what, is, what is taking place in, in, in the country. And uh, just some uh, reflections uh, from the resolutions. Uh, uh, maybe that, that the last year the resolution uh, were uh, after the elections, after the Duma elections, when we called immediately to carry new elections um, uh, after registration of all opposition parties, uh, which is. Uh, uh, which is, of course, fear, demand, and, and, and many others uh, do so. But uh, I hope again that you will uh, hear tomorrow more from Russian uh, friends uh, what it means now, really, the registration of the parties and the new legislation, even which is now passing the state Duma in order to uh, easy, ease uh, the registration of the parties. Uh, like in before, you need 5,000 people in order to establish the party. Now you have the possibility to establish the party only with 500 people. Uh, but still, if you start to establish the party, then you face a lot of uh, bureaucratic uh, problems. And of course, uh, the situation itself, um, uh, that uh, it's like by purpose, uh, politically. If you imagine, already now, uh, since the law is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is passed and about uh, around 100 uh, small political parties are already uh, raising, raising, and, and you see in the country uh, where such a political uh, uh, explore, exploration of the parties is, uh, is suddenly so active. I think it's also a little bit destabilizing um, democracy and, and uh, 
just avoiding to create a strong uh, united opposition, uh, democratic opposition party. So, uh, and um, yes, uh, just very shortly about the summit also after the uh, Duma elections, uh, then, uh, then uh, despite of these um, uh, questions of not free and fair elections, which were also discussed in the summit, but at the same time the, the business um, uh, on the practical level uh, goes, uh, goes on. Uh, and then the, the policy also towards visa-free travel is still uh, in place in the European Union. This is uh, something uh, maybe controversial, it sounds controversial, but uh, at the same time um, uh, it's very clear that uh, we would like that Russian uh, citizens can still uh, travel easier uh, to the EU uh, and, uh, and study in the EU because this is in favour of just normal ordinary citizens because this Russian uh, corrupted uh, elite is travelling anyway with uh, diplomatic passports normally uh, who does not need any visa but uh, just ordinary people uh, 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 would uh, benefit of course uh, much more from this uh, visa free travel and and, um, and therefore this uh, is uh, still uh, very much in our agenda and also the cooperation in arab spring countries um, I will not stop here too long because this uh, afternoon we will later on we will speak about uh, Syria and other countries and uh, and also some uh, some uh, latest uh, resolutions from this year again uh, we um, we uh, uh, we we just urge Russia to implement their international commitments uh, before the uh, international organizations to carry the free and fair elections. And uh, the EU PCC, this is the Parliamentary Cooperation Committee, this is the European Parliament uh, uh, Committee and, and Russian Duma uh, Committee, and we have a joint meetings. And the first time now we uh, ask them and, and also implementing, uh, demanding actually that without uh, involving um, uh, non-parliamentary opposition, opposition and civil society, we wouldn't have a meetings. And we had just a recently meeting in Moscow where this was really implemented. Uh, opposition, not, uh, not, uh, not all of them, of course, came uh, to the place, but this was first time. And, and I think it's uh, sort of um, also a sign from the part of European Parliament that, uh, that uh, if we say that we ask for a new free and fair elections, it uh, also in reality de facto it means that this elected Russian Duma is not legitimate body with whom to uh, build up the, the relations. And, and therefore we would like to, we, we need to have with them dialogue, but at the same time we also would like to keep a dialogue with the, the non-parliamentary opposition and, and civil society. And uh, the latest uh, resolution after the presidential elections um, uh, where also we said that uh, there are irregularities, uh, uh, the um, falsifications of the uh, elections, and um, and and uh, and also once again we reminded then to Tuma that uh, the revision of the electoral laws should be taken place, what they have been doing, but of course um, not in in uh, in favour also uh, in favour of changing the situation in better. So and. Uh, um, yeah, I should stop here. Yeah, the, because we can uh, have a discussion also about this Putin's um, uh, now possible um, coming to office um, for the third term and what it means and and how we where we are going to. But of course, um, uh, just concluding it, uh, saying that um, from uh, in the moment, as as we understand it in the Parliament, in the European Parliament that uh, we continue to support uh, democracy and, and civil liberties in, in Russia through different means, through different ways of cooperation and, and uh, just economic and political relations in accordance with status quo. Uh, what means that um, uh, we will probably uh, lack the possibility to, to create more closer and stronger um, cooperation, especially in the uh, international relations. Uh, in respect of North Korea, Iran and, and, and other countries. So thank you very much and, and um, well, thank you for listening. <laughs> and I'm sorry to be critical, but this is a reality. <laughs>